And, and what would be the dream outcome of your work, uh, say 20 or 30 years down the road? Uh, what would be the best case possible scenario that you can dream of and that you are waking up every day with a smile on your face and, and you, you want to accomplish this? What, what is this? How, how does it look like? The dream outcome is a, an in vivo method of uh, carrying out an upload to a whole brain emulation so that you have a substrate independent mind. Um, yeah, and, and knowing that it works, so having it validated. A validated in vivo method of doing it. Like, Post-mortem methods are interesting, but in vivo would be really my dream. So that's, that's, that's fascinating. So let's, let's try and break this, this best case scenario in part. So first of all, what's the big deal? Why should we want to upload our minds to begin with? What's the benefit of doing so? Well, there are a number of them. And I try to outline them, for example, in the paper that I posted on Kurzweil AI, uh, Pattern Survival versus Gene Survival. And there's going to be more in some of the other uh, writings that are coming out in 2012. I have a contribution to the book, um, The Transhumanist Reader, and one that's coming out in the book called, um, I think it's called The Singularity Hypothesis. Not that I personally attach a huge amount of value to either of those labels, but I thought it was a good opportunity to try to write about the reasoning behind substrate independent minds. Why is it important? Why would you want it? What's it good for? And of course, you know, a lot of people who are looking at this see this as a way of potentially living longer. So, okay, if you can actually transfer your mind, yourself, as you are, into some form where it can be backed up and can be uh, fault tolerant, uh, can exist in many places so that if something happens in one place you're still fine and all of this stuff, great. It could uh, help extend your, your being, your, your sense of being, your life. Um, but there's more to it. I mean, if you look at the bigger picture, well, actually I should look at two sides of it. Near-term big picture, long-term big picture. Near-term big picture, look at all the other methods that are extending our lifespan. Most of those methods um, treat it as a problem of keeping the body going and don't really worry too much about what the mind will be doing when we're 200 years old. But even if you have a perfectly healthy elderly person, say someone who doesn't have Alzheimer's disease, what would they be like at 200? Would they be just like a 16-year-old? They obviously wouldn't because they've experienced a whole bunch of things and that's a great thing that's wisdom right you've experienced a lot of things but it also means that you're building a filter so take a, a slice of tissue from a, a baby you see that there are still many connections being formed take a slice of tissue from someone who's 14 or so and then you find that there are a huge number of connections and then take an adult slice and you'll see there are way fewer and it's not surprising because a lot of things have been pruned don't get used very often and other bundles strengthened, which is very useful because it means that you react faster, you have instant recognition of things that are familiar and you deal with them in a familiar way so that you have automated ways of dealing with all the problems in your world. Um, but these filters mean it's very hard to accept entirely new kinds of thinking, new approaches to things, which is why we always struggle with a generational gap. And you can imagine that if you're 200, that becomes even more so. So you're still totally there, you're cognitively active, etc., but you always see things through this particular filter. Meaning that even just living longer is actually cause to deal with problems in our abilities, in our mental abilities, in our capacity to deal with information. So we do need to look at that, even, even if you're just talking about some relatively short-term extension of life. Now in the long-term picture, um, we have all kinds of challenges ahead. What we are right now is something that has been evolved to help our genes survive on this planet in this environment as it is right now. That doesn't mean it's optimal for all other challenges that are coming up. It doesn't mean that we understand the challenges that may be coming either somewhere else in the universe. I mean, we can't even take off our spacesuit on the, on the moon, right? That <laughs> destroys the environment in which this body lives, in which that mind works. So that doesn't work. We can't actually sense the moon. We can't really experience what it's like because we're always breathing our own refiltered air inside that spacesuit and whatever. Yeah. So there's that. And then there are other challenges we can't even imagine right now where you need to be able to 
think differently, where you need to process different kinds of input, and where you need to compute in a different way to really be able to deal with those challenges. And some of them may even come from our own creations. Um, imagine that we produce machines that have really good thinking capabilities, and their capabilities may in many ways outstrip our own. A calculator already outstrips mine when it comes to doing precise calculations. And I can't even imagine what it's like to think with quantum computation. And those sort of things are the kind of challenges that I would like us to be able to continue meeting. I, I think that the reason why we feel we have some control, some limited control, over where we're going is because we're currently the most intelligent, dominant species on the planet, and we can sort of coordinate that between one another. We keep each other in check, too. There's a balance of power going on between these seven billion people where Sometimes you have someone who goes off on a crazy spree of dictatorship, etc., but they eventually get brought under control. Now, if we were not, let's say there's something else that's more intelligent than we are, then our situation becomes a lot more like the situation of the other species on Earth, where maybe we don't mean them any harm at all, it's just that we have completely other goals. It's like, you know, it's not that we want to take away the livelihood and the, the environment in which gorillas really like to live, it's just that you know, we have other uses for that land. We have other ideas in mind of what we're going to do with that. And that could happen to us. And basically, we're no longer in control of where we're going at that point. So if you want to stay on top of that, if you want to meet all these future challenges, you need to be much more flexible and adaptable. And I think what that means is we need to take charge of the adaptations that we can carry out, the adaptations of ourselves, our ability to grow not just in terms of taking in experiences, but grow in capability as well. So we as a species can continue to grow. And I think that's one of the main things that Substrate Independent Minds tackles and dares to address, that a lot of other thinking that goes on in related communities where it's about life extension or artificial intelligence and such don't really go into. I mean, maybe the closest is, is the brain-computer interfaces, those interests, and neural interfacing. Um, and that's also very closely related to, to SIM, actually, so that's not surprising. So, so say that the process of mind uploading uh, is in the very last step of, uh, towards its completion. How do we go about verifying whether the sort of um, the, the whole brain emulation is an exact copy of the original as you said, in vivo. Mm -hmm. That is actually the reason why I said in vivo. Because um, there are some really interesting proposals about how to do the development of a whole brain emulation post-mortem by taking a brain and slicing it very thin, reconstructing mm -hmm. it in 3D and correlating the components you find in there with libraries of components that have such morphology and distributions of parameter settings. This is basically the approach with the automated tape collecting ultra Oh, uh, lathe, sorry, the automated tape collecting lathe ultra microtome, the Atlum. Um, but the the approach is dangerous in from an engineering perspective because uh, it's very difficult to correct for systematic errors. Random errors, the brain itself is relatively good at dealing with because it's robust. You can have all sorts of brain damage. You can have all sorts of neurons dying from I don't know alcohol poisoning or something. And, and you can still function. You have uh, you know, a distributed network there. But if you have a systematic um, error instead of a random white noise type of error, let's say that while you're scanning, uh, you always measure dendrites one micron too thick or something like that, then these might be things that if you don't notice them and you don't know how to compensate for them directly, they just show up in your result. And, uh, and that's that. You press the big green go button and it's an entirely different functioning mind than you imagined. This is where combining structural scanning and doing in vivo functional work really comes in. You need that second dimension of information where you're providing validation, where you can say, okay, so this is what we have here. This tells us a lot about how it's connected because it's giving us the structure. And at the same time, we've measured the kind of function that this component has, and we know how it operates together with the others when they're all operating together. So we can check if our model is doing the same thing. 
Um, there's a little more to it that I could get into as well because there's a problem of missing latent function when you're doing functional scans. There's a problem of what I just said about the errors and in, in, uh, the structural stuff. But, um, and of course a one-to-one -one mapping that you'd have to have in structure to some function. But just to, to show what I would actually prefer as an engineering approach is not one where you build the entire thing and then press a green go button. It would be much better, in my opinion, if you can replace bits and pieces at a time and test whether they're still operating correctly. You could even test them in parallel. You'd have the same input going to the actual neurons and to the artificial ones and see if the network you've produced produces the same output within some error margin that, you know, because not even a biological network produces exactly the same output for the same input all the time. It doesn't work that way. But you want it to be within a certain margin. You want to see whether it still works within the whole. So you want the whole to be alive and to be functioning so you can see whether this replacement is okay. That's kind of the same that you would do for any neuroprosthetic or for any prosthetic in general. And then as you go, you eventually build something that works and is validated. I, I would prefer that approach. I find it much more comforting from an engineering point of view.